Last week I completely forgot to say, well, welcome to the Halloween season. Spooky, scary skeletons and shivers down your spine. Mom's gonna kill us. <laughs> Just one drop. Oh! <laughs> Spooky, scary skeletons and shivers down your spine. And as I did last year as well, I'm gonna make four videos this year, which are always gonna be horror themed. And for this week, I decided to do something a bit different. Some might even call it weird. Mostly because this is actually my 100th video. A great success! Yes, I've made a hundred videos since the day I created this channel, which is actually insane when I think about it. I have no idea how I got to a hundred so quickly in barely two years. And actually soon it's gonna be the two year celebration of my channel as well. But I wanted to make something different. I really enjoy, for example, theorizing and analyzing movies through a lot of different lenses. I don't necessarily enjoy reading plot lines and telling you the names of all the actors, telling you basically things that you can find online or Wikipedia. I do enjoy creating parallels in between different movies and series made by different people and this video is not going to be an exception because today I'm specifically talking about a trend that we've seen across the different years and it's the whole idea of basing your movie on the main character's trauma and capitalizing on it as much as possible to the point that it becomes kind of voyeuristic and then we start asking ourselves whether we're supposed to enjoy this or we're supposed to denounce it and it kind of leaves us in this weird limbo when it comes to our emotional state where we don't know how to feel because it seems like the creators don't know what kind of message they're trying to deliver as well bad baby bad baby did you ever not make <laughs> did you <gasps> mystery you had sex with her every time you met didn't you didn't you liar I wanted specifically to talk about this topic because of two things that came out on Netflix lately. First of all, it's Andrew Dominic's Blonde, which came out just a couple of weeks ago. And the second thing is Monster Damer, the Jeffrey Damer story, which is the stupidest title ever. I'm pretty sure I know why they decided to call it this way. And it's probably because last week there was another docuseries about Jeffrey Dahmer that came out, which was called Conversations with the Killer, the Jeffrey Dahmer tapes. But at the end of the day, there's still two titles that are incredibly long and it could have been simplified quite a lot but I'm also sure that they wanted to give this topic here in this series a bit of an art house feeling to make it more important so that we don't really think of it as just yet another docu-series about true crime that is coming out on Netflix it kind of reminds me of Zac Efron's Ted Bundy movie which was called and I actually need to look this up on my phone because I, I keep forgetting how this movie is called because it's so incredibly unnecessarily long and weird and it was called Extreme wicked shockingly evil and vile the Ted Bundy movie basically yeah I wanted to talk specifically about the two main characters in this series here so Jeffrey Dahmer and of course Marilyn Monroe within the movie Blonde of course they share nothing at all Marilyn Monroe is actually more of a victim of everything that was going on within her life well Jeffrey Dahmer is the perpetrator of a lot of incredibly disgusting crimes that I can't even name on YouTube because it probably get me demonetized or it probably get me banned or whatever talk dirty to me But the reason why I wanted to link these two together it's because the very core of these two shows slash films is trauma. We're looking at the main character's trauma and we're trying to basically understand what they've been through and to try to understand how they became basically the people that we know them as today. Of course completely different stories when it comes to Blonde and Jeffrey Dahmer. I really want to stress this. It's not like I'm trying to create parallels in between the two outside of this video here. There's nothing that links them together from a narrative perspective.
This is also not going to be specifically a review of those two properties there. I still haven't finished the series about Jeffrey Dahmer and I refuse actually to finish the movie Blonde. I've seen approximately like 70% of it, mainly because I wanted to make this video first. Because while I was watching Blonde, for example, if you want to start with that one, I really had the feeling that despite the movie's intentions, it kept objectifying Merlin as much as possible. And it's kind of interesting because from a factual perspective, from a formal perspective, perspective from a filmmaking perspective blonde is actually an exceptionally well-made movie you know my favorite thing about the movie is like it feels like a like a movie it feels like a real like you know go to the theater film movie that you know you, you kind of the reason why you go to watch something on the big screen and I'm not incredibly surprised that they received a standing ovation at the Venice Film Festival when it was presented. Mostly because it is a really beautiful looking movie. Andrew Dominics is playing with a lot of different formats. He's playing with black and white and color. A lot of different layers and textures when it comes to the amount of noise that he decided to put in. He plays with the editing style as well. Creating some weird imagery that kind of reminds me of David Lynch's movies or even David Cronenberg's movies. But this is just the surface level when it comes to appreciating this movie here because even when it comes to the script for example Because the story is kind of told through a stream of consciousness lens meaning that we don't really recognize where we are in time where we are location wise, whether the story is actually told through Marilyn Monroe's perspective or whether it is being told to us from a narrator perspective. And this is kind of a problem for a lot of different reasons, even though it definitely stands out when it comes to all the different biopics that we've seen recently. Think about Elvis, if you think about Rocketman or if you think about Bohemian Rhapsody. I know I'm mentioning only musical docufictions. That's just because those are the most popular ones in the last few years. Sometime between me going to the loo and then getting back to the kitchen. Somebody ate my jam on toast. There were only two other people in the house when the crime took place, because it is a crime. My brother Max and my mother Jan, both of whom deny having any Involvement. Bum -bum. But they tend to follow a very strict guideline when it comes to the story itself. It feels like you're following a Wikipedia plotline, right? And this is not the case when it comes to Blonde. And of course, me as a cinephile who watches way too many films, I appreciated that, of course. But at the end of the day, something that was incredibly disturbing from the very first scenes of the film is that Marilyn Monroe is objectified across the entire movie. This movie is actually feels like it's exhuming her body and using it to tell the most controversial and the most vile story possible. There is no happiness, there are no moments of clarity when it comes to her character. It just feels like we're watching her being tortured for three hours. Marilyn Monroe, Marilyn Monroe, Marilyn Monroe. It kind of reminded me of Darren Aronofsky's mother. Well, first of all, Jennifer Lawrence said that she would never make that Mooney. Mooney? What the fuck is a Mooney? First of all, Jennifer Lawrence said that she would never make that movie again because it was an incredibly horrific situation when it comes to how it was shot. Blonde kind of reminds me of Mother in the way that it's throwing so many things at the main character, one after the other, to the point that we can't even digest it properly. We can't even try to relate to her. She's just kind of like the vessel to the specific message that the director wanted to convey to the audience. A message about men and women and how they work within the Hollywood industry. A message about abuse. A message about creating a persona that kind of escapes your own control. But at the same time, the way that the movie is shot, it never really allows Marilyn to drive the narrative. It really feels like she's being dragged on the floor and she She's chained to a car and she just keeps getting dragged and dragged and dragged across the different traumatic events of her life. Circle of light is yours. 
And to give you a very specific example from that movie there, think about the scene where there is the wind coming out of the ground and there is that famous shot of her skirt going up and her smiling and everyone going completely insane over it. That scene there could have been shot in so many incredibly different ways to allow us to get into the mind of Marilyn Monroe, to allow us to get into her perspective so that we would understand what she's actually feeling and going through. But the camera is actually shooting her from every different angle possible and there is even an angle that literally goes under her skirt showing us her underwear in slow motion. Just to tell you this is the kind of movie that we're in. We're in a movie that wants to objectify her. We're in a movie that uses her as an object of desire and wants to abuse her as much as possible just because it looks good, just because it makes for a good story. Some people are sick in the head. That's all I'll say. Because, I mean, who comes up with this stuff, right? I don't know. I don't know. Who comes up with this? You know what movie was good was Avengers Endgame. Not necessarily to reveal something interesting about Marilyn Monroe, not necessarily to make us understand what she was going through. A really interesting contrast would be, for example, the movie that came out some time ago with Kristen Stewart, who was playing a Princess Diana, for so the movie Spencer. That movie really was from the perspective of Diana, and it, we could really feel everything that was going on through her head and what she was up to before her death. And then compared to everything that is going on in Blonde, which feels incredibly provocative, but at the same time so incredibly superficial and cheap. Funny enough this reminds me of another review which I made a couple of months ago about Alex Garland's Men and I literally have the exact same arguments from that movie there. Meaning that here we have a main character who is not really driving the narrative. She's being drugged on the floor and she's being used to convey a specific message about something that sounds like pseudo feminism but at the end of the day just looking at this woman being abused over and over again until we get sick of it. A human body is meant to be seen. Admired and desired. Not hidden away like some ugly festering wound. I think it's kind of interesting to look at Andrew Dominic's filmography and realize that most of the times he actually made really kind of gritty movies about men. It's actually not surprising at all when you think about it that he would not nail that aspect when it comes to Marilyn Monroe's life. And at the end of the day, I kind of have a hard time believing that Anna de Armas could be able to make a movie like this just because it is a movie that feels so incredibly disgusting to be in and that is really not pushing any message forward that we are supposed to hear and that is actually gonna turn this into a constructive experience. That is all that I have to say when it comes to Blonde at the end of the day. I don't recommend it and I don't want you to support it in any kind of way because I feel like it's an insult to Marilyn Monroe's memory at the very least. Let's move on to the Jeffrey Dahmer series which once again from a foremost perspective, from a filmmaking perspective, it's incredibly good. Eat it. It reminds me of Mindhunter, so David Fincher's Mindhunter, which is an incredible compliment at the end of the day. And I kind of feel like they actually use some of the sound design from Mindhunter at the very end of every single episode of the Jeffrey Dahmer story. just because they want to create those links in the people's subconscious so that you inevitably fall in love with the series itself just because of how beautiful it is how beautiful it's shot how well it is written as well because at the end of the day it doesn't really follow everything chronologically but pacing wise it still feels like it is exciting and we don't know exactly where it's heading even though we know probably a lot about Jeffrey Dahmer's murders and story and there is of course the argument of do we actually need another Jeffrey Dahmer 
Dahmer adaptation because I still clearly remember the movie My Friend Dahmer which came out a couple of years ago which was actually quite good as well and it was really trying to put us in the subjective point of view of Dahmer and was focusing actually on his early teenage years so not necessarily on his gruesome crimes and it was kind of a bit of a Gus Van Sant elephant thing where we were trying to really analyze his childhood as much as possible from someone else's perspective and not always from his to understand what actually made him the way that he was but when I think back on it I don't really remember it being that exploitative and it was also adapted by a critically acclaimed comic book that I haven't really read yet but I've looked at when it comes to visual style and it's actually quite interesting of course the series is made by Ryan Murphy and that's really the main reason that pushed me to make this video here and that's really the thing that should tick something at the back of your head being like Ryan Murphy is the best person when it comes to taking advantage of these kind of situations if you look at American Horror Story American Crime Story if you look at other stuff that is made in his entire filmography he loves to make these very provocative projects and in almost every single thing that he worked on someone is not gonna like it and for very good and valid reasons at the end of the day so I'm not surprised that he was the one behind it but at the end of the day I'm pretty sure that this is the best work that he's done as a producer in his entire filmography because the Jeffrey Dahmer series really allowed us to get into the mind of Jeffrey Dahmer but at the same time gives us the perspective of the victims themselves and of the audience and the police investigation and everyone who was basically surrounding Jeffrey Dahmer but at the same time it is such a close close look at Jeffrey Dahmer's life that it starts to feel incredibly disturbing and you feel like you shouldn't be enjoying this and you shouldn't feel sorry for Jeffrey Dahmer but I've seen other tweets online being like uh, people who feel sorry for Jeffrey Dahmer are incredibly disgusting but it's not their problem the problem comes from the series itself the way that it's structured the performances the writing and the way they've decided to shoot it as well if you feel sorry for something it's because of the power of cinema it's because of they decided decided to cast Evan Peters in the role as well and Evan Peters is quite known for playing those kind of deranged yet incredibly attractive psychopath if you think about American Horror Story I mean in American Horror Story I think at one point he even plays a character who is so attractive that he manages to convince one of the main characters to commit suicide to be with him forever really toxic I know and Evan Peters is an incredible actor at the end of the day I really love his work but just to say that he's got a pretty creepy following because these are the roles that actually made him famous because he looks like a weird emo fucked up teenager and uh, a lot of people love that about him in cult last year i got to play a lot of crazy characters uh jim jones david koresh doe or do we never quite figured it out uh from heaven's gate jesus manson that was the other one uh yeah i got to play manson that was really intense i did a lot of research on those guys so there is that of course and as i said before there is the writing and there is that very human thing of wanting to get to the core of someone's personality and trying to understand them and that of course creates sympathy and at the end of the day that's why people have been saying that they feel sorry for jeffrey dahmer it's not their fault it's the way that this story has been written it forces you to sympathize with him in some kind of way even though what he's doing is incredibly disgusting and it's really funny because i've seen a lot of other videos on this topic topic specifically and I actually want to mention them as well because I think you might really enjoy them and these are the videos that really push me to make this video here to discuss basically the idea of trauma and how we connect so deeply with it despite the fact that sometimes that trauma has motivated a lot of heinous crimes for example and I'm specifically talking about the YouTube channel The Take and the two excellent videos that I've made the one that is called The Dangers of Making Everyone Too Pretty for Screen the other one is the dead girl and why it's so dangerous to simplify her and when I watched those two videos here there it really opened up my eyes when it comes to why we sympathize with these monsters why people are so fascinated by them and at the end of the day why the Jeffrey Dahmer series is incredibly disturbing in a lot of different ways you know we had one rule going into this uh, from from Ryan that uh, it would never be told from Dahmer's point of view as an audience you're not really sympathizing with him you're not really getting into his plight you're more sort of watching it you know from the outside now that's what i call bullshit we won't forget first of all when it comes to the casting itself and the idea of choosing evan peters to 
portray Jeffrey Dahmer. Of course, it was done 100% on purpose to attract even more attention to this series here, but that's something that has happened quite often within the industry. I mentioned Zac Efron's Ted Bundy a couple of minutes ago as well, and that was an excellent example of how to choose someone who you would never imagine to be like a serial killer. And other people like Matt Smith, when it comes to the movie Charlie Says, when he was portraying Charles Manson. And even if we want to step away from all the serial killers, think about other dramas like the idea of choosing Jesse Eisenberg to play Mark Zuckerberg, the idea of choosing Michael Fassbender to play someone like Steve Jobs. Michael Fassbender is incredibly attractive, how dare you? Or even the idea of choosing, for example, someone like James Franco to play Fidel Castro in a movie that is coming out in a couple of months, maybe years. So this idea of choosing incredibly good looking actors to play these real people, to attract attention to the movie itself, but also to glorify the action of that person, to make us sympathize with the person as much as possible. For example, now we know that Mark Zuckerberg is a bit of a weird lizard person who doesn't have a lot of emotions going on, but Jesse Eisenberg still made us feel something about him. And same goes with Michael Fassbender, even though Steve Jobs is probably the most opportunistic capitalist person that exists on planet Earth and that he probably like abused so many people in his entire life and we've got the same thing here when it comes to Evan Peters and Jeffrey Dahmer every single time that the camera lingers on him every single time that there are those moments of silence where he's just thinking about something or he's drinking by himself or he keeps repeating things like why do you always leave me why am I always alone it's something of course that immediately shakes us at the deepest core of our humanity and the idea of not wanting to be alone and the idea of at the end of the day not having friends not having a a support system that allows you to thrive as a human being and that's something that everyone can relate to so they kind of dumb down his core emotions to the most simplistic thing ever so that everyone could relate to him even though he is a disgusting person at the end of the day it's only by episode six that the series actually starts caring about its victims can you imagine how incredibly groundbreaking it would be to have a series called the Jeffrey Dahmer story and to have every single episode from a different victim perspective, retracing all of their lives, trying to understand how they got to meeting Dahmer and being silenced. I feel like that would have been the best thing to do when it comes to trying to tell this story without idealizing, without glorifying all the trauma that Dahmer created through his killings. Because at some point we have to stop and start thinking about what the message actually is when we keep making all of these documentaries and all of these docufictions about serial killers. Is it actually about the serial killers or is it actually about the victims? I don't want to ever see my mother have to go through this again. Never, Jeffrey. Jeffrey, I hate you, motherfucker. I hate you. And I've seen a lot of things going on online when it comes to this series here and mainly the fact for example that it's become almost popular among TikTok people and specifically among TikTok white women who are fans of true crime who don't really think that the show was that problematic and that the show was actually that violent at the end of the day and I found some tweets that I wanted to read as well because it's important to remember also that Jeffrey Dahmer was actually abusive mostly towards the gay community so the LGBT community but also the black community for example this tweet that I found that got viral was saying something like there is a whole trend of white women on TikTok flexing how they were so unbothered and unfazed by the Dahmer series on Netflix if you find the depiction of anus targeted murders or LGBT and black brown and people not disturbing enough then something is wrong with you and if you look at the actual like TikTok screenshots that were in the tweet itself they were saying incredibly disturbing things like raise your hand if you were part of a handful of people who were completely unbothered by the Dahmer series and he's watching it again. This girl literally has Dahmer earrings and she's saying when everyone is freaking out about how morbid the new Dahmer show is and you just bummed that they didn't show this, the actual morbid parts. Hearing all the people say they couldn't make it through one episode of Dahmer when I binged the whole show on phase then watch his trial and every interview of him that exists. That's suspicious. That's weird. And this of course led me into other interesting researches about this kind of topic here of how specifically white people 
or white women as well because I've read actually a lot of articles saying how the main target actually for tree crimes tends to be white women or white middle class women and there is some interesting things going on with that the idea of for example watching tree crime to protect yourself and to learn from the victims and what they did and what they did wrong so they basically you could survive if you were put in that kind of situations and that's basically the psychological analysis that has been done on the community of women that seems to be so incredibly in love with tree crime and of course I'm just reporting the news about the controversy things that I've seen on Twitter things that I've seen going around on Twitter and I'm not necessarily giving my opinion on that kind of stuff because I'm a white man at the end of the day and I'm also not a huge fan of the true crime genre even though I've seen a lot of fictionalized movies about serial killers and slasher movies at the end of the day I don't have an incredible fascination with the reality behind it so yeah that is basically where I'm coming from funny enough I also have a counter argument to my own arguments when it comes to whether the series here is exploitative or not because for example I reminded myself of the series Dexter which at the time wasn't considered to be exploitative wasn't considered to be that deranged at all or even the series Hannibal both series really put you in the perspective of the serial killer and uh, they try to excuse him and they try to make you sympathize with him as much as possible and at the end of the day that's what the fans did but I think the difference lies in fiction versus reality when it comes to these things when it's fiction we are almost allowed we're given the permission to sympathize with the serial killer in a different way than we're not when it is real life and when there are actual stakes honestly i was very scared about all of the things that he did and diving into that and trying to commit to that was a, a absolutely going to be one of the hardest things i've ever had to do in my life because i wanted it to be very authentic but in order to do that i was going to have to go to really dark places and stay there for an extended period of time i wanted to make this video mostly because i thought it was incredibly interesting how this year there have been a lot of movies specifically concentrating on women's traumas and some movies and series did it well and some other movies did it incredibly badly and exploiting the trauma as much as possible to create clicks and to create controversies the movie that i talked about last week as well don't worry darling that one as well is about women's trauma but it is told through the perspective of the main character who happens to be a woman and the filmmaker herself is a woman as well so of course she channeled all of that into the film itself Netflix has been following and creating this trend of glamorizing evil, despicable people for quite some time. At the beginning of the year there were other docuseries like one called Inventing Anna and another movie about the Tindler Swindler. The one about the Tindler Swindler we didn't really try to empathize or sympathize with him in any kind of way but when it comes to Inventing Anna it was kind of very interesting how at the end of the day even though she is a criminal the show was 100% on her side and trying to depict her almost as a modern Robin Hood and of course the ethics of that are incredibly questionable so everything that I was talking about today was about manipulating audiences into believing that trauma can be helpful when it comes to sympathizing with a specific character and we discussed all the ethics of that whether it's something that is good whether it's something that it is bad or whether it's something that is at the end of the day actually useful to relate to a character whether it's something that you actually need there are so many characters who are good who experience a lot of happiness within their lives and at the end of the day we still sympathize with them we don't need the trauma to love people we don't need trauma to feel sorry for people and we don't need trauma to make us relate to them in any kind of way there are better ways to do it and I really felt sad while discovering these two very different projects and at the end of the day I don't even know whether you should watch them or not for all the reasons that I've been talking about in this video anyways let me know down in the comments what you thought of Blonde and what you thought of the Jeffrey Dahmer story. I've talked about so many different aspects and so many different theories when it comes to how we relate to these two projects but I'd really like to know what you actually thought about it. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Every single like that you drop will go to the memory of Marilyn Monroe because I think she's someone who really deserves more and if you actually want to add something every single like that you drop will also go to the victims of Jeffrey Dahmer who apparently were 
were not even consulted when Netflix started working on the production of the series itself, which is incredibly disgusting. There are victims who are actually experiencing this series for the first time without knowing anything about it and people of course talking about it and communities praising it for a lot of different weird reasons. That's incredibly awful and they really deserve all of our support. I'm Patrick and this is Torn Apart. Getting my butt tight as hell. Gross, Jen, I'm your cousin. Hey, Hugh, you want to play Wolverine one more time? Yeah, sure, right. That was weird. <laughs> Da 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 da